Welcome to C2G Talk, a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with influential practitioners and thought leaders to explore the governance challenges raised by emerging approaches to alter the climate. I'm Mark Turner, a Senior Communications Consultant with C2G, and I am speaking today with Clara Botto, a Brazilian climate justice campaigner who serves as the science policy thematic facilitator of the major group on children and youth to the UN Environment Programme, and is uh, currently working with C2G's Youth Climate Voices on the governance of solar radiation modification. Uh, amongst other SRM related activities, Clara was an observer to the marine cloud brightening fieldwork taking place in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and wrote a statement and a science policy brief for the UN's eighth STI forum. Clara also campaigns with World's Youth for Climate Justice to get an advisory uh, opinion from the International Court of Justice on the climate crisis as a human rights issue, and has been named a new European voice on existential risk with the European Leadership Network. Clara Botto, welcome to C2G Talk. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. Brilliant. Well, let's maybe start with your journey. Um, growing up in Brazil, what motivated you to get involved and work on climate change? And you know, maybe how do you see the climate crisis affecting your country? And, and how do you envisage this changing over your lifetime? I believe that growing up um, as a kid, I was very much connected to nature. Um, thanks to my stepfather, who is a bird photographer. So I grew up traveling to um, random uh, parts of Brazil, which my friends weren't aware of, and definitely not touristic places. Um, and at first, I guess I wasn't aware of um, all of the problems that we had concerning the environment, but I already had this deep appreciation for nature. Um, but when I was 15, I... I think that was when I first um, considered myself an activist for the environment um, because of veganism protests. Um, so when I was 15, I, I became vegan and I understood that our current food systems, they have a huge impact on, on the climate. Um, and so that was my entry point into, into climate works. And then um, shortly after that, I, in different aspects of, of my life and, and my studies, I made sure that I was linking what I was doing to both um, the environment and, and climate. Um, and then thinking of your question on how the climate crisis is impacting Brazil, um, I think in the different places that I grew up in there, I was familiar already with natural disasters, which to my view, there aren't natural because the disasters itself, they only happen because our communities are not resilient to withstand um, the, the phenomenon. And so I think if we have already been seeing those happening in the past decades with, with the climate crisis, as we all know, they will be intensified. And so I, I, I'm really worried because we still don't have cities and communities that are resilient um, to those events and the tendencies that they will keep um, becoming more frequent. So in, in your self-introduction, you use the word, you, you realize you're a climate activist. What, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to be an activist? Um, I think it's standing up for what you believe in and for what you believe is wrong. So it's, publicly speaking of the things you believe should be changed and to my like in my experience also pointing out solutions or different pathways to the current narrative or the system that we have great well and then of course you got involved in international climate diplomacy how, how, how did that happen how did you get involved in the, the world of the united nations and climate talks I think as many of as my as many of my friends um, at school having the the typical um, UN um, UN model system um, being discussed in class and being also part of model UNs. So I was actually only part of one model UN. It was about the the World Water Conference, if I'm not mistaken, um, when I was 15, 16, around that. 
Um, and then later on, I became aware that there were opportunities to get involved um, in the UN system as a, as a young person. So in 2018, I believe you were a, a youth delegate to the UN Youth Assembly. How did you find that? What what were your first? You'd done a model UN. This is the real thing, right? So how, how did you find it worked out? It looked like in practice. Um, so back then, it was the first time I was in the UN, and of course, it's as a young person. Then when you go there, it feels really really important, right? Um, and I went with the with the Brazilian delegation, but the youth assembly isn't meant to come up with any um conclusions or decisions or anything um but it really struck me that for quite a few years i felt that i was the only one within my my the bubbles that i was in 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 brazil i felt that i was the only one that was like really concerned about the problems of the world that we face and that really wanted to make things and then going there and being exposed to young people from all around the world it, it gave me a bit of hope that we had we had a, a bigger body of people that was trying to do the same things that I was. So it, it, yeah, it felt hopeful. You mentioned that the assembly wasn't there to take decisions per se, but I, I, I'm interested, how do you feel in general, to what extent do UN processes hear and take into account the concerns of young people? What kind of avenues there are to make sure those concerns and thoughts go into some kind of decision making processes? I think there are different avenues that a young person can become part of the system. Um, that doesn't mean that they are efficient and that uh, young voices are really listened to and taken into account. Um, but we have structures such as youth constituencies to different UN bodies. And I believe these are pathways that young people find not only to learn, but also to make contributions in the different UN processes um, that we have. So what does it mean to be the science policy thematic facilitator of the uh, children and youth major group to the UN Environment Programme? There's a lot of, a lot of different terms in there. Can you help me understand what it all means? Yeah, so as I had just mentioned, we have the system of youth constituencies. Um, and so the one that serves UNEP is um, CYMG. So as you said, Children and Youth Major Group. Um, and basically we, as young people, as part of this constituency, we can provide our inputs to the, to the processes that UNEP has already been following. Um, and so UNEP, whenever they have to consult with their stakeholders, for example, um, they ask for the, for the children and youth uh, major group, um, if we have any contributions to make to a specific document, or if they're hosting a conference, um, we usually try to make sure that we have young people attending which, who are part of the of the constituency, and then there they can also either poli uh, pressure policymakers or make statements on behalf of the constituency and so on. Um, and then as a science policy um, thematic facilitator, me and my my colleague, we are on this one year mandate. Um, and then we have the freedom to look at different science policy processes that uh, UNEP is following. Um, and again, not only provide our own inputs and, and learn, but then also report back to the bigger um, constituency on what has been discussed specifically on science policy. Right. So what um Going to uh, closer to what C2G does, um, we see there is this idea uh, being touted that there could be uh, a form of an approach called solar radiation modification, which could help um, be an additional source of reducing climate risk by reflecting uh, some sunlight into space. Um, what got you interested in that topic and what attracted you to the uh, C2G's Youth Climate Voices program? So the first time that I heard about SRM, um, so solar radiation modification, was back in 2019 at the, um, I always forget the exact name, but International Climate Geoengineering Symposium that happened in, in Rio de Janeiro, where I was 
space back then. Um, and I attended as an observer. And at first, what really struck me was that I was the only young person in the room, um, even though it was a public event. Um, and also that climate geoengineering and SRM back then were terms that I had never heard of before, even though I was already engaged in, in sustainable development and climate and environmental groups. So um, leaving that conference, I was even a bit afraid that I was the only, again, young person there in the room that had listened to all of the things that the scientists had said um, and a bit alone that no one else was talking about those technologies. Um, and so for years, um, till I heard of C2G, I had SRM and geoengineering as terms in my head, um, but didn't have the chance to explore them. And the first time I, I heard about C2G was, um, was in the beginning of 2022, when they were preparing um, a talk about the role of science fiction and, and new emerging um, climate technologies. And I had read a, a lot of science fiction talking about the topic and that interested me. And it felt really good to see that there were organizations that were looking into something that had been in my head for a while. Um, so that's how I got into C2G and SRM more like with more energy. Great. Well, t tell me a little bit about how the experience has been. What have you done? What have been the highlights? What have you learned about SRM and its governance doing this? Um, I think it was a very enriching experience in the sense that I had to opp the, the opportunity to take a step back and, and really learn about not only the science, but also what other stakeholders groups have been saying about SRM and what's the current state um, of SRM governance that we have in the world. Um, and then as I was already someone that was interested in the topic and even a bit scared that those things weren't discussed um, in like in a main, mainstream way, um, it gave me a lot of knowledge and the chance to engage with people who are already um, either doing research or talking about those things for years. So there, um, let's let's maybe dig into some of the actual SRM approaches being explored. The most well known, the one that often gets the headlines, is this idea of stratospheric aerosol injection, and we'll talk about that in a second. But others include marine cloud brightening and ground albedo modification. Um, let's let's take a couple of these in turn. I was really interested to see that you were an observer to the marine cloud brightening project in Australia. Um, I'd love to hear a bit about that experience, what you did, what impressions you got, and um, yeah, what kind of issues you think it raises? Yeah, so um, I I was invited to be a part, well, I reached out to the team that's doing the, the Marine Cloud Brightening um, work in Australia, and I was invited to join them as an observer in the in the field work. And it, it felt really um, inspiring to see that things that you, only read um, in policy briefs, for example, during our learning pathway um, in C2G, they're there happening and there's a big team looking at that and they're really committed um, into the work that they're doing. Um, and it's very different just reading about different types of technologies and actually being there on the field and seeing how it works, right? Um, so it was definitely like an, an experience that before I, I could never imagine how it would look like. And it brought me lots of questions. I already went with questions and I think I came back with tons more. Um, hey, can, you, can you describe it a bit? Um, did you get on the boat? Did I, I'm just interested, exactly what did you do? What did you see? I'd, I'd love to hear about what it all yeah. looked like in practice, yeah. So there are different research stations and I was mostly in three of them. So there were two uh, vessels that were conducting the experiment. One um, was the, the, the one where the machines were, and the other one was collecting data um, from the experiment. And then they also had 
islands where they were also collecting data. Um, and so I was mostly in the in the data vessel and on the island. Um, so I got to spend more time with the scientists that were analyzing the results from from the experiment. Great. And so what kind of lessons did you come away with about marine cloud brightening and what kind of ideas did it did this experience give you in terms of how it might need to be governed? Yeah, so unlike other um, SRM technologies, um, marine cloud brightening is very local. And so the the intention of this experiment there in Australia is to protect the, the Great Barrier Reef um, from the mass bleaching events that have already been happening in the past years. And so um, the I think the main thing I got from the experiment is that first we still need to see if that's viable if we can really get the theory and the lab work of of marine cloud brightening into practice um so it doesn't matter if they can see that yes we can brighten the clouds if there won't be an impact in the reef um and so i believe it, the the process of getting the research done is much bigger than we think because apart from all of the atmospheric scientists who are looking into that there's also a huge collaboration that is being done with marine biologists for example for them to assess if brightening the clouds um can make the the reef uh, more resilient um, you've also expressed interest in learning more about the Arctic Ice Project. Tell us about that and, you know, what your initial thoughts are there. Um, so going to another part of the world, right, the, the Arctic Ice Project is, well, wants to um, assess a different type of technology. Um, they use um, micro hollow steer glasses um, that can again reflect solar radiation um, back and the, the idea there is that those um, glass spheres can prevent um, the glaciers from melting they're not doing um, feud work yet um, first they need to assess if this technology um, won't harm the environment so all of the the marine life for example that is under the water will where they'll place um, the spheres and I so I didn't attend any of their field works because um, they're not happening um, but I was with their team um, in a fundraising event to learn more about the current state of research and and how civil society as a whole that is supporting the their project um, sees climate interventions great and let's move on to um stratospheric aerosol injection, um, this idea of spraying essentially aerosols into the stratosphere to reflect back um, a small portion of sunlight, perhaps analogous to what happens after a volcanic eruption. Um, what issues does that raise for you and what plans do you have to continue following developments in that area? So I think the key difference, as I've mentioned already before, is that SAI will involve um, global um, impacts, unlike the research done in the Arctic or the one in Australia. Um, and I think even though I haven't personally engaged with any research team that's looking into SAI, only some like scattered researchers, um, I think we need to have really global conversations to address something that will have that might have global impacts if we decide that we need to use those technologies um, and under the current um, global governance system that we have um, we don't have solutions for how to govern SAI so I think as more universities or governments um, start putting money into SAI research for example it's key that we are already putting energy and efforts into talking about its governance. Great. Well, you and your colleagues from the Youth Climate Voices uh, program 
are developing a platform, I understand, called SRM Youth Watch. Uh, tell me a little bit about what that will look like. What are your plans with it? How, how can that help build governance around these issues? So we're still in initial stages of coming up with this platform, as you said, SRM Youth Watch. Um, and, but I think the main idea is that we need to have a global youth um, platform, not only to host um, youth-led initiatives that are already looking into SRM, very different types of, of technologies and from different areas of studies, from students uh, with a philosophy background that are looking into SRM or engineers that are looking into that. So we want to be a platform that can host those different um, projects, but also um, hopefully a recognized um, network that can provide inputs to governments or think tanks or even individual policymakers that want to become uh, more informed about SRM. So I'm interested what kind of reactions you've had from fellow climate activists, fellow uh, people in the youth movement um, to your interest in SRM. Uh, what kind of, because obviously there's some deep concerns uh, held by many about these uh, approaches and, and and some would really oppose you know even research let alone um, you know going any further to how how what kind of reactions have you had what kind of conversations have you had uh, and, and and how would you say young people are kind of viewing these ideas I think um, the the main reaction I get is of complete um, complete shock to hear about those technologies because it's something new so i've been in many situations where climate and environmental activists are just surprised to hear about something um, that is being discussed in the international sphere but that is not getting to their attention um so that's one of the reactions that i get um there's also a bit like the opposite of not wanting to talk about it because it's to their opinion too controversial um i've also heard that we shouldn't actually be talking about srm not because it's controversial but just because we have other priorities um as some of my colleagues think um and then there are some that are just very skeptical about it. any um, climate altering technology because they think it's too sci-fi or it's not realistic so why would we waste time talking about them have you ever felt a sense of personal criticism from some people that oh you shouldn't be involved in this how, how have you dealt with that kind of sense that you're taking quite a bold step into this area yeah i think um not criticism but um looking into srm but I think um, some young people, because they've never heard of SRM, they think um, it's a bit sketchy so that I'm involved with like sketchy things or things that only happen behind closed doors um, that I don't know, like really, that I'm like a really futuristic thinker person or something like this. Um, so I wouldn't say that I've received like strong, um, strong and negative views towards what I've been doing, but just um, some people are a bit cautious about where I'm, co I'm coming from and who I'm dealing with in a way. There's, um, you mentioned earlier, you know, your interest in nature and that's partly what brought you into this is, there is one sort of, I guess, area of concern amongst some critics that SRM is unnatural, right? And 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 this is we need to be dealing with these issues, not with unnatural, but going back to nature. How how do you feel about the relationship between nature and technology, and how does SRM potentially fit into that? I think the point that we're at right now is unnatural because we humans have brought us here, so it's already a given. We're in the Anthropocene. We have created. Um, all of those things that are happening in the climate around us. Um, and so in an ideal world, I wish we wouldn't be talking about SRM as well, that we would 
be using um, only nature-based solutions, for example, to tackle the climate crisis. But then in an ideal world, we wouldn't have the climate crisis in the first place. Um, and so I think that this um, strong attachment that I have to nature is actually what got me into, into SRM because I think we just need to be looking at all of the solutions that we might have and that might help us to preserve what we have. Um, but I think this also comes with an understanding that we as humans are part of nature um, because I think ecosystems and nature, if we're speaking of them detached of, of human beings, um, they're much more resilient than we are. So I think it's also bringing us of uh, humans back into a position as as part of of nature and and the planet as a whole. As you develop this um, platform, which will include sharing information about uh, SRM, what kind of challenges do you see in a world with so much misinformation right now, where so many confusing sources of experts or not experts are telling everybody all sorts of different things about everything how do you you know help young people find the right sources of information to to deal with misinformation how are you going to approach that i think um we have to rely on science on the best science available and on like trustworthy um research that's being done on srm for us to inform young people on what those technologies are. Um, I think a lot of misinformation comes um, from just think, saying things out of our own mouths and not fact checking, for example. Um, and also because again, SRM is very controversial and we have very strong opinions about it. I think sometimes people just say things um, that might be wrong just because they haven't read um, an article that was published two weeks ago, for example. Um, and this happens because it's a topic that's evolving really fast. Um, and so I think that information also needs to be up to date with the research that has been happening. Um, so I think it will be about constantly updating ourselves on what has been going on in the scientific world. Um, also, uh, thinking about your work on um human rights, climate and human rights. Do you see a relationship between SRM and human rights and climate justice? How, how would they, how would SRM fit into those frames, those objectives? Yeah, I think that two um, communities that are very climate vulnerable, um, historically, I think SRM as a tool um, needs to be decided by those, like the deployment of SRM in those communities needs to be decided by them as they're the ones that have already been um, struggling with the climate crisis and that as research tells us, will be suffering in the years to come as well. Um, and so I think the human rights approach to SRM is that we need to inform communities that will either benefit the most or be negatively impacted the most um, if we are to use one of these technologies. Um, so at this point, I would say it's providing accurate information so that they can make their own mind about those technologies as well. So just to finish on this bit about the SRM Youth Watch and your plans on that, what, is there anything that we should be looking forward to over the coming months or is it still very much in the design process, the design phase? So last week we had um, our first event that happened in, in Bangladesh. Okay. Um, yes. Um, and in the coming months, so in September, we'll be in, in New York for side events happening around the UN General Assembly. We have um, just confirmed that we'll be hosting an event on the 17th of September. So you can save the date and more information will be published in our in our website. And then Till the end of the year, we're planning um, to also be part of another environment and global governance related events. And the website is? srmyouthwatch.org. Um, Great. Um, maybe I could just finish on 
a sort of a broader question about motivation and hope and anxiety. Um, I mean, there's a lot of concern out there about uh, the rising levels of climate anxiety amongst uh, young people and you know how that might impact the way they see see the world and the decisions they make. How, how, how do you keep hope? How do you maintain hope whilst also being you know aware of how serious the challenges are? And what kind of advice do you have for uh, others who might be struggling to see a, a brighter future? Um, I think that's a question I get a lot also because I've struggled. I, I do struggle still with climate anxiety. Um, but I think I, I've just changed my mind um, towards how I tackle the climate crisis. So I think I've lived a phase of um, climate doom, um, but that didn't mean that I was stuck and didn't do anything. But I think um, there are stages of climate anxiety that don't really help us to move forward or to be our best version. So if we're just angry and complaining about everything, um, that won't help because you're not proposing solutions. Um, but then if you're, if you're really impacted in a way that also makes you just get stuck somewhere, then you're also not moving forward and not progressing. So I think it's not about shutting down the anxiety feeling, but it's about how you can use those things that you're feeling to move forward and to help because otherwise um, we might just end up going down in a rabbit hole and climate anxiety is a real thing. Like I, I know depression can be, can come from climate anxiety. Um, and so I would say whenever I'm talking to a friend, for example, that has been struggling, um, I think the best thing we can, not the best, but one of the things we can try to do is to find where we see ourselves most useful um, in, in the climate fight. Um, which is not only in climate groups, for example. You can be an artist and contribute. Um, you can be a doctor and contribute. So I think it's just about finding your place and and doing the best you can each day. Well, that's a great thought to end on. So thank you so much, Clara, uh, for taking part in this CTG talk. Thanks, Mark.